An exceptionally accomplished animal behaviorist, Mark Beckoff once said, research on animal morality is blossoming. And if we can break free of theoretical prejudices, we may come to better understand ourselves and the other animals with whom we share this planet. He argues that we must abandon human exceptionalism, which is the notion that humans are supreme to all other beings. Only then may we begin to become more empathetic to non-human animals, helping to expand our human morality. So our very special guest today, Alexandra, is Mr. Mark Beekoff himself. With a PhD in animal behavior, he's a leading figure in the field, having published more than a thousand essays and, wait for it, 30 books. <laughs> Not to mention he was the first American to win his age class in the Tour de Haute Var bicycle race in 1986. Man after my own heart. <laughs> or maybe I'm after his, I don't know. <laughs> But his work goes beyond just studying animals. Um, he also co-founded a nonprofit organization with uh, Miss Jane Goodall. Few people know who that is. So today we're going to discuss the terms uh, compassionate conservation and compassion footprint as Mark Beekoff strives to teach us that animal welfare is a critical component to biological conversation. Cool stuff. Great. We're going to go deep. I'm and we're going to dive right in. Since you have written 30 books, we're going to just have to just bring it down a notch and start with one. <laughs> I don't know if we'll get through all 30. Uh, and so rewilding our hearts is, I mean, the word rewilding means to make wild again. And in this book, um, I guess you, you, you argue, you state that unless we rewild ourselves, um, and become profoundly reconnected to nature and fundamentally completely shifting our consciousness, um, our conservation efforts are really going to have no impact or very limited impact. Mm -hmm. Explain what that means. <laughs> <laughs> oh, my goodness. Um, <coughs> yeah, I mean, the basic message in Rewilding Our Hearts, really that it becomes a personal um, endeavor, personal journey, if you will, to reconnect with other nature, which includes non-human animals, human animals, and all sorts of flora as well, just nature as a whole. And so you can have all these movements and you can have lots of different organizations and societies, but really where the change comes is in how we if you will relate to ourselves, we take care of ourselves first, not in an egocentric way, but we take care of ourselves. And that way we have the energy and time and other resources to take care of the world and to increase compassion and empathy. So that's really what it is all about, just to reconnect with I actually have a nature. personal experience with that myself. Mm. Uh, if I could share with you, and maybe you could comment on that if you've, if you've encountered mm -hmm. this kind of thing. Um, I went on something called the Great Peace March in 1986, which was a walk across America to promote peace and protest nuclear weapons. And uh, we were a hardy group of 1,500 crossing the uh, desert. From We started in LA, and it took us five and a half weeks to get to Nevada. And I, I at the time, was um, suffering from an eating disorder. I was bulimic, quite bulimic. But during those five and a half weeks where we were on the peace march, we were just, we were walking outside and we were camping and I didn't have a single episode of wanting to purge, wanting to binge or anything. Mm -hmm. And when we reached the Nevada border, just past the border, civil, we were back in civilization because we had been without, basically we were on, um, fire roads most of that mm. five like and you're getting weeks. closer to vegas and yes the getting and closer to civilization we came to this store and i my the craving f to binge came back so forcefully that it scared me and mm -hmm. i was completely freaked out and i felt that it was because i was back in this world of fake foods and stress and things like that and disconnection you, mm -hmm. yeah yeah yeah. Yeah. I mean, one of the things that I always listen to 
um, when I'm talking with people is how sometimes they'll say, well, I'm just really having a bad day. So I took a walk. In my case, take a bike ride. I stop like on all my rides. My teammates and others think I'm nuts, but I say hello to all the animals. So I say hello to all the prairie dogs and all the cows and all the birds. Where do you live that you see these animals? Uh, in Boulder, Colorado. Oh, beautiful. So, so, and they laugh, but I'm not really doing it for effect. I'm doing it because it makes me feel good to welcome all these animals um, and say hello because they exist and to acknowledge them. And I also say hello to trees and flowers. I mean, I don't know what they're perceiving. And I, frankly, I don't care what they're perceiving. It just brings me closer to them and makes me appreciate them for who they are, not what they are. Mm. And I think that, you, I mean, I'm sure you all know too, that sometimes people are just having a bad day. They just go outside, take a breath of fresh air, like your walk. And it's amazing how so much disappears. Um, it can come back and, diff- you know, I'm, I'm not a doctor or a psychologist or a counselor or anything like that, but, but a lot of times people make an exit and then things come back when they get back into, if you will, an environment right. mm-hmm. that enables that. What do you think's happened that society is becoming less and less connected to the natural world or recognizing the natural world or um, saying hello to the natural world like you do on your bike rides. Where did that start happening? Why is it happening? What, and cause we're, well, we'll talk about all of the negatives that's taking place because of it, but, but what, why do you think it's even happening? Oh, I think there's a lot of reasons. I don't, I'm not sure they come in any um, particular order, but one is that people are just so busy. They just, busyness just consumes them. They don't have time for anybody, if you will, mm-hmm. but themselves. Um, and, and I think the other is just mechanical devices. You know, mm-hmm. you can tune into just different things like phones and iPads and TV and stuff like that. And, and I have a phone and I have a TV, but it doesn't substitute, you know, for mm-hmm. close connections, if you will. Another, I think, is that, and that's what gets back to personal rewilding, that a lot of people just are very discontent. And I don't mean that in a negative way, but they're discontent with the world at large or they're discontent or they're discontent with whom they are. And it's hard for them to get beyond themselves. And I really don't mean that in a negative or a pejorative way. It's just that they're in a very demanding, complicated, overstimulating world. Mm -hmm. And they're just, I, I sometimes think they're just floundering about trying to make it and and I think they exit that that world when they begin to connect with other beings, whether they're non-human animals or animals or plants or rocks or rivers. Well, I think you're completely right. And uh, they've done studies, actually, to just walking in nature um, helps people's blood pressure and things like that. Mm-hmm. And also, if you have um, a community, a, a housing block, uh, the more trees you have, the less crime and the happier the people are who mm-hmm. live there. Even if it's just a couple trees, they've done studies yeah. where they've compared the exact same buildings, look exactly alike, same number of people, and they've just planted a few trees and that made all the difference. Um, There's now, a great book called Your Brain on Nature written by a doctor at Harvard Med School. And so she good. reviews all the some data like that, but she also looks at what your brain is like when you step outside or when you interact with another animal, including another human animal. So there's a real neurobiological basis to these feelings. What about that emerge. what we eat? You, you yourself are vegan. How does that affect what Dotsie was talking about, which is this disconnection? Right. God, that's, that's another five books. Um, <laughs> but um, <laughs> no. Well, first of all, I like to say it's who we eat, not what we eat. Ah. I like to say, and that's a game changer. Um, it came to me maybe a decade ago when I was talking to somebody and mm. I first tried it out at a talk in Vienna. And a year later, five women who were at my talk in Vienna wrote to me and said they had all gone either vegetarian or vegan because I said, it's not what you eat, it's who you eat to stress that 
you're eating beings, individuals who formerly, if you will, were sentient beings with feelings. They're who's, not that's or which's or it's. Um, I think diet is critical. I mean, I, Dotsy knows, you know, I mean, years ago, I, my favorite lunches after long bike rides or races were bacon cheeseburgers with extra French fries and a Coke. I haven't quite escaped the Coca-Cola and the French fries, <laughs> both, both vegan, but um, that's how I get my calories. But it came to me because I was writing a lot about animal behavior, animal emotions that I didn't really need to eat these animals. I mean, that's really what it was. And overnight I went vegetarian. I mean, it was, it was, I always say I went cold tofu, not cold turkey on the meat because I just, I just decided to stop. Um, I believe sincerely, and I don't know if there's any scientific data for this, but in my own case, I never really realized a change in energy level or anything like that. I mean, I wasn't an Olympic athlete like Dotsie, but I was racing pretty seriously and doing really long stage races because that was my forte. I had no problem at racing a week or two going vegetarian. And the only non-vegetarian, the only um, animal part of my diet, which was very rare, was every now and again, maybe once a week, I'd have a small piece of cheese. So my diet was, I used to figure out 99%. 99 plus percent vegan in terms of calories and, if you will, the mass of food that went into me. My idea, though, is that I and maybe other people, I process food, you process food much more naturally, if you will. I mean, I know evolutionarily we're carnivores, although there's a lot of information coming out now how early humans were maybe not strictly vegetarian, but highly vegetarian. Um, I just think you process food more. And I think in terms of connecting with other animals, you begin to see them as the beings who they are. I mean, I, I, you know, I, I, I really mean that. And I think some people think I'm an ass or something like that because they'll order a hamburger, but it's really a cow on a bun, a bun or a bacon, mm -hmm. lettuce, and tomato sandwich is really a babe lettuce and tomato sandwich. And so I think what happens is when, as you change your diet, and I can say this with a lot of my friends, um, they connect in a different way. To Do other you think animals. we create this dissonance mostly out of convenience? Or do you think that, you know, we've got a, we've got a lot of dangers facing us um, with this disconnection continuing to happen on a broad scale. Mm -hmm. So w why, like I just, we just went through, um, the floods in North Carolina. And there was, you know, I saw literally hundreds of pictures that I didn't want to see. Um, over 5,000 pigs drowned. Mm -hmm. Literally millions of chickens did as they got abandoned. They were used and abused. And then they just abandoned them in their cages that they couldn't get out of and drowned. And then conversely, you're seeing um, multiple, um, quote, heroes, which they are, but saving dogs and cats from the floodwaters. So that's obviously just a very specific example of a dissonance of um, living, breathing, sentient beings that just have different faces, maybe different tails. Pig's mm -hmm. tails are cuter, in my opinion. Um, what What is that dissonance from convenience? What else? I think the dissonance is that so many people are familiar with companion animals such as dogs and cats, for example. And they create this false dichotomy, companion animals, food animals, mm -hmm. clothing animals, whoever, you know, however you want to describe them. And that's why I always say to people, would you do it to your dog? Would you let your dog grow up on a factory farm or in a laboratory? And would you shoot your dog for fun? And what I do <laughs> with that is bring it home to animals with whom they're most familiar. And I do a lot of work in China. And I remember people t saying to me, how can you go there? You know, they eat dogs and cats there. And I'd say, oh, well, I just left the United States where we eat cows and pigs and chickens and mm -hmm. other non-human animals. And I only said it to drive home the point is what's more, why, 
the question I ask is, why is it really more egregious to eat a dog than a cow? I mean, I know the answers, but dogs don't suffer less than cows, for example. So mm -hmm. I think people make these false dichotomies in terms of the utility of an animal. Mm -hmm. Companion animals, on average, make us feel good. That's their utility, their use. Um, food animals nourish us. I got an email yesterday that I, I printed out and based at it because I thought about our interview and it dealt with compassion and conservation, actually. Mm. And the guy ended it saying, oh, all you fruity, all you fruity people, you know, are you vegan pot smelling, pot smoking, <laughs> <laughs> you know, naive people? Why are you criticizing people for eating the animals who were put on earth as food? And we hear that all that's, the time. Yeah, that's a basic yeah. difference, I think, is, is we don't believe that animals are on the planet to serve us. We believe they have their own lives and their, their own, own purpose, re their own purpose, their own meaning, their own right to be themselves. And you've written so many books that look at animals <clears throat> in a more personal way so to get mm -hmm. so that readers will understand that bees are not just these little things flying around and making honey for us or and can sting us. Right. Yeah, like or that. that elephants aren't just big animals we can see in a zoo. And yes. I'd love for you to share a couple things, because people do put animals on a hierarchy according to, to mm -hmm. our own mm -hmm. values. Mm -hmm. Like, are they mm -hmm. smart? Like, please, we don't do that with humans. Like, you're not as smart, so you... Yeah, you, I'm going to eat you. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> we don't do that with humans. So why would why do we do that with animals? Well, we've been taught that. So, Or they're not as cute. Or there's so many different reasons mm -hmm. we use to devalue an animal. Can you talk a little bit about what you've learned about animals that we might not know that might help people who aren't yet there in terms of looking at animals as equals. What some cool, interesting things that animals do that don't have anything to do with humans, by the way. Don't. Yeah. <laughs> or they're interested in us because goodness yeah, right. gracious, maybe I mean, they're not they're interested okay. in us. No, right, right. I know. Yeah, Imagine right. that. Um, um, yeah. I mean, over the last, I mean, certainly the last 10 years, but really even a longer period of time, there's this field called co uh, cognitive ethology, which is the study of animal minds and what's in them. So it deals with animal intelligence and animal emotions, for example. And for me, um, the notion of intelligence is a real slippery one. So in people, we have different sorts of intelligence. So yes, mathematical intelligence, social intelligence, street smart intelligence, scientific intelligence. And you see the same in non-human animals. But one of the things that's important for people to realize is that there's no relationship between how much an individual suffers and how, quote, smart they are. Um, so I move immediately into the notion of sentience and consciousness mm -hmm. and emotions. And I mean, the amount of information we've learned in the last 10 years, maybe even the last five years, um, is mind blowing to people. Just the depth and the ex broad range of emotions that different animals feel, not only mammals, but birds and fishes, pigs, for example. Pigs are bright animals with very deep feelings. I mean, we know that they squeal when, when a piglet is ripped away from his or her mother and have their tails cut off and they're castrated when they hold them up, mm -hmm. they squeal. They're not squealing because they like something. I'm, in my book, The Emotional Lives of Animals, I have this quote from a scientific paper, which made me ill, but it's basically the researchers talking about how different levels of squealing are indicative of different levels of suffering. Mm -hmm. So they know they're causing pain, mm -hmm. okay? But they still do it. Chickens. We know chickens display empathy. We know chickens. How do they display em feeling. empathy? They display empathy, empathy for well, other chickens. Yeah, yeah. There's been studies where they've blown air into the face of a chicken to make them and to make them uh, emit distress calls, for example. And mm -hmm. other chickens come over and do you know take care of them. Mm -hmm. Now, some people would say, well, we don't know if that's empathy, 
But it's the same behavior pattern that if you saw a dog do it or a chimpanzee do it or an elephant do it or a human do it, mm-hmm. you'd call it empathy. It's like, you know, I think one of our... The, the the biggest reason that the dissonance takes place is because we don't spend the time, the quality of time or any time with some of these food animals like we do with maybe the companion animals. And you have studied these animals, but there's a group of 30 chickens that came in after a, um, a Kapora, um si- situation, I'll call it. And you guys can oh, look that up, situation? a Kapora situation where um, it's a... a a very um, old um, Hasidic Jewish uh, tradition, atoning mm-hmm. of the stens for sins, and and um, again, it's it's pretty brutal. So I'll let people kind of look that up and read on their own. But um, thirty chickens came into an animal sanctuary, Indraloka Animal Sanctuary, where I was about a year ago, and I wasn't, you know, eating animals at the time, but I had never spent any time uh, with chickens ever. I, I mean, you know, I, I just assumed that they had their own feelings and emotions and, and, and lives just like we do. But I spent in my hazmat suit because they came in, right? And we had to quarantine them, um, went in with them, with all 30 of them and spent about five hours. And mm-hmm. I just sat on the ground <clears throat> and observed and, and took part in whatever they wanted me to take part in. And there were all these distinct different personalities that played out in that five hours. Some of them really, really scared of me and nervous and very introverted and off to the side and kind of pecking around with each other and not when he have anything, anything to do with me, understandably so, all they'd ever seen is cruelty and misery from humans. Others very extroverted, um, you know, coming up, pecking me, running away, coming up, pecking me, being funny and gregarious. Um, some that were just so in need of some kind of comfort and some kind of love and some kind of sharing that they were glued. There was three of them that I couldn't peel off my hazmat suit on my chest. They were so deeply in need of just that feeling of its love and 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 compassion. There was all these different personalities unfolding in front of my eyes. And that's what we just don't spend one single second doing. Why would we think that they have these experiences if we don't sit and and realize them and be with them and see how they behave similar to us sometimes not similar to us that doesn't mean good or bad it just is the case right well i, I, well, I think it's this I, the the word dissonance really comes in here where people just make the, i don't even know if it's inborn and you have to overcome it or you learn it um maybe people have studied it but people are really, really good at denying things. Mm-hmm. Like in Rewilding Our Hearts, I talk about homo denialists. We are really great at denying things. So it's like I'm a research scientist, and but I do field work, and that's what I've done for decades. But a lot of my colleagues um, will come up with excuses. Oh, we need to do this because it helps humans. It's, it, it's never the case that it helps the animals. So... In my book, The Animal Manifesto, I wrote a section, a very good friend of mine. He still remains a really good friend of mine. He's a lovely man. Um, He said, I know they suffer, but I love my burger. Mm -hmm. He's not a mean, I mean, depending on how you can look at him, but he's a wonderful man. He's a great father. He's a great husband. He's a great person. He's a good old lefty liberal. And that's what he says. So we talk about it, but the inroad I've made with him over the years, and I think I see a a difference, is that he knows they suffer and he doesn't want to add suffering to the world. You you have a book called Why Dogs Hump and Bees Get Depressed. Mm -hmm. I was interested in knowing, uh, I think people, now actually there's actually more compassion towards bees because we're worried about ourselves and we know that mm-hmm. bees so <laughs> unfortunately if but if that's what gets people to save bees i'm i'm okay with that but I, like a third of our food in the world yes exactly like we and would die without them that's why people are less apt to kill a bee now but when mm-hmm. i was a kid everyone was wanted to kill a bee um because they thought they were just pain insects and they didn't want to be stung um mm-hmm. so a lot of us we look at animals purely in terms of how they can help us how do how do bees get depressed and how how would i mean not how do they but how do you know bees get depressed and tell us about some of these animals that people put no face no they no attribution to mm-hmm. 
Well, the study of bees was really interesting. And it's a very detailed, elaborate study, but basically you can stress the bees out and you can also turn them into pessimists where they'll give up on a task mm -hmm. when they're really stressed. The unique part of the bee study and there's just been some more done on insects and fishes, for example. I mean, I know they're vertebrates and invertebrates, is they show the same changes in neurochemicals in their brain as we do when we go through different moods, such as depression. Mm. These do. Wow. That's so, so interesting. Right. And so do bees suffer? Yes, I believe they suffer. Do we know how they suffer? Well, I'm not sure we know sometimes how other human beings mm -hmm. suffer, but because you've got the same neuro basis, if you will, to a behavior pattern, that's, I'm very careful to say that's a bee depression, for example. It could be bee joy. And the point I always make about food animals is that, number one, people go, oh, they're stupid. Well, they're not. And then there they're drawing the correlation, if you will, or the false correlation that because they're stupid in their minds and they and then you're not just talking about suffering physically you're talking about being in a cage for years um or being mm -hmm. in in a for example on in zoos they mm -hmm. suffer emotionally oh that's what i'm really focusing on the suffering physically i think is a given mm -hmm. i mean but actually not it, until recently no people and didn't really say, accept and it. there still remain a few sickies out there who um argue that we don't know whether animals suffer. And there was a recent article written in the newspaper about that, saying that, you know, we're making all these attributions about grief or sadness, for example, but we don't really know what they're feeling. And I always say that I'm glad I'm not that guy's dog because he, and, and, I, and I don't think he was doing a tongue in cheek, but the vast majority of people with whom I interact really know that other animals have rich and deep emotional lives. Getting back to what you said before, Alexandra, I think it's the shared emotions that bonds us, you know, that we feel pet rocks didn't make it, robotic dogs don't make it. Mm -hmm. What the big task today is, is to get people to transfer those feelings from, if you will, companion animals to, quote, food animals, laboratory, circus animals, animals who are there solely to serve us. These animals get nothing out of it as individuals, even for their species. That's just, it's just a lame excuse to use them for our benefit. You've talked a lot about um, how animals, you know, how they help each other, how they motivate, motivate each other, um, even how they mourn each other. Mm -hmm. um, how, do, how do animals mourn each other? Pick, pick a species and tell us how they mourn. Well, you could look at dogs with whom so many people are familiar, but the same with elephants and even birds now. Um, they'll often mope around. They'll become less playful. They'll um, stop eating. They'll, there's a whole change in their gait and posture. Remember when I went to northern Kenya and I saw elephants who were being studied by um, an elephant expert named Ian Douglas Hamilton. He's like the, quote, Jane Goodall of elephants. He's been in Samburu, northern Kenya, for now almost 50 years. And I jumped in his Land Rover, Land Rover when we got there, we drove out. And immediately there were elephants wandering all over the place. Their ears were down, their bodies were down, their tails were down. You could feel their pain. And I said to Ian, there's something wrong here, Ian. And he said, oh yeah, the matriarch died last week. Mm. In elephant society is the oldest or give or, take, or the almost oldest female is really the head of the herd. In this case, it was, I think, a 65-year-old mm -hmm. female. And she died, and the rest of the animals in the group, those shared emotions, the magnet of her magnetic personality and her knowledge and traditional knowledge was gone. And then just a kilometer down the road, there was a herd of elephants where they were playing, sniffing one another, and sleeping. Okay, so, so you... I don't know, you have to open yourself up or one has to to empathize and step into the pause, uh, if you will, and lives of these animals. That's one. Dogs, I mean, the humane societies, the ASPCA, other, other organizations, 
have booklets to have, you know, how to deal with a dog who has lost a human or another dog, or, or in one case, I remember a dog losing a lizard who was another companion animal in the house. They stop eating, they mope around, they become less playful. I once spent um, time with a cattle rancher. This was just last year. Spent some time with him trying to understand his psychology. And uh, this was on an organic grass-fed farm. He only had about 30 cows. This is a place where the you know the local farmer's market high-quality non-suffering meat came from, right, that people, di- that people buy. And uh, he didn't believe in sending them away to uh, slaughter. He wanted to make sure it happened there on the property so he had more mm-hmm. control over what was happening. So he would bring some on the property. And um, so he would slit their throats um, right there in, in the middle of the other 29 that were surrounding the one that was being killed. So you can draw your own conclusions on that. Um, but he said to me, and I'll never forget this, he said, you know, because I was asking him what the reaction is from the other um, cows and their it's their mother first of all, and their, and their father that are standing there and their sisters and brothers. Um, and he said, you know, they, they react for a little while, but you know what? They're fine. They go right back to eating immediately after. And I thought, you know what? That's interesting. That's what we do as humans. We go to a funeral. <laughs> then where do we go? We go back to the house and we eat. We're fine. Yeah, right. Wow. <laughs> you yeah. know? Yeah. I've heard, I've heard stories like that. And in the wild, of course, well, it animals... suits us. It suits us to think that, right? Yeah, it serves a purpose. It's, it, it, it justifies for some people they're eating, they're raising these animals and then killing them and eating them, even if they're quote more humanely raised. They're mm-hmm. still killing them in the end. But I've heard you know stories like that as well. In the wild, I mean, I studied coyotes for nine years in the up in Wyoming, and I've seen wolves and I've worked with penguins in Antarctica. And what happens in the wild is they go through, say, a mourning period, a grief period, but they have to get back to life. Mm-hmm. So some people Survival. will say, oh, you know, these coyotes, when, when their mother, uh, her children, because they, they like to, biologists like to call them their offspring or their young, but they're their, her children. Well, her children mourned her, but they had to, and her husband, they had to get back because life out in the wild is fast, is um is demanding. And so somebody said, well, yeah, they sort of mourn, but they didn't mourn for that long. And I'm saying they don't have that luxury. Mm, yeah. yeah. Mark, um, Michael has a question for us. Yep. So we're going to let him pipe in and how do you feel about d- domestication? I mean, the, 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 this attitude, you know, cause there are animals I've been present with animals, like almost asking to be domesticated for some reason and who knows why, mm-hmm. but they show up on your doorstep and almost knock on it. Mm-hmm. How do you feel about that? And is there an appropriate truth to domestication? Cause people, wild animals, people clearly who work in that space are like, don't do that. Well, <clears throat> the di- there's a difference here. Um, you're really talking more about socialized animals, not domesticated animals. Domestication is an evolutionary process. Dogs are domesticated. Um, cats, with whom we share our homes, are domesticated. Um, and the reason I draw that distinction is because domestication is an evolutionary process that takes quite a long time. So people will say, or, or cows who you who are raised for food are domesticated cows, but they have wild relatives. My favorite bird is a crow. I've loved the crow. I think the crow is one of the most intelligent birds on the planet. And uh, I really, you know, I pay attention to them. They marry, they or they marry, they, uh, they, uh, they might. you know, they, they, they might come, marry. They come, I think Mark they, will know about they crows. They come together and they're a family for life, you know, and I find that just extremely fascinating. Yeah, they but it's marry just, and they have children yeah. and they go through courtship and they grieve. I mean, there's a good example of what I was talking about, about the use of words. But these animals who, anim, who, you know, it's a really different topic in a sense, but these wild animals or animals who are non-domesticated beings, they don't make good companions. But are they, ha- I pets. mean, I even yeah. have issues with some domesticated, I, I mean, I sort of, the way humans treat domesticated animals oh, yeah. seems to yeah. ignore all their wildness completely. And they're supposed yeah. to be in an apartment for all day, walked for yeah. 10 minutes in the evening, in the morning, not able to go to the bathroom in between or do anything. And they're alone and aren't dogs pack animals. And uh, and that's it. And they're supposed to be owned by us. 
It's for a, our it's pleasure. Really a, it's really for, a yeah. myth that our, quote, homed companion animals have great lives. I mean, some do, but, but it's a myth that because you live with a human being or with a human family, that you're having a good life. It really is. Because you're the fed. The amount of mm -hmm. psychological problems, obesity, physical problems, cancer, and all that is rampant. And I'm not saying that because of my position on animals. You talk to veterinarians and you do talk to dog trainers. I mean, dog training industry is, it's burgeoning. And it's because we're asking dogs to adapt to our lives. Mm -hmm. And so the reason that I'm saying that's, it, that's a huge topic. Yeah. And I don't think there's a simple answer to it. My answer right now, and I, and I just published a book on dogs, um, is that if you choose to bring a dog into your home, but it could be another companion animal, for example, then you better be ready to change your life. And it's a myth. People get reptiles, for example, lizards and snakes. They're the most difficult companion animals to keep. They die in horrific quantities. That's what's great about you as a scientist is a lot of scientists do look at animals from a human point of view, but you try and look at animals from <clears throat> the animal's point of view in their natural habitat. And I wanted to ask a question that Dot came up with when Dotsie and I were researching this show, and that is that your um, Jane Goodall, who's done incredible work and is an incredible animal activist, uh, I understand that she is not vegan, but she is vegetarian. And mm -hmm. I just wondered if you could talk, not necessarily about Jane, but about these other people who love, if you want to discuss Jane because you know her, um, who are animal lovers, but yet, or, or, and know a lot about animals and know what's going on with the food industry, yet they do not become vegan. Yeah, I mean, my take on that, and I had an email yesterday from a woman with whom I've had contact, and it was a long email, and it basically referred to these two to people as hypocrites. And her question was, could these hypocrites make do well that you have amazing things. emails mm. by the way mark i mean no, these I, people are yeah. passionate when they write to you <laughs> so you can't believe some of the emails i get oh, on the other that's side that's what happens that when you write 30 books really <laughs> but 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 the important question that you have there is yes they can i mean i i know some carnivores if you will who put millions of dollars into conservation so i think we need to be extremely careful about saying, oh, someone is not vegan, mm -hmm. for example, mm -hmm. or vegetarian, mm -hmm. and is not a good person. Right? No, no, I wasn't saying they weren't good people. It just seemed to right. be a disconnect. And the way they, I, there's a disconnect. Yeah, and I, my own personal feeling is that I don't know how they do it. I mean, I've been there, we've all been there, and I don't know how they resolve that dissonance. And what has Jane said? Because you're, you're close disconnect. with her. Well, I think Jane is an interesting um, individual, and I believe me, I don't want to speak for her, and I don't like to. Say, I, I'm not going to say anything. But, but number one, she doesn't eat a lot, <laughs> and I really mean that. And I think her non-vegan um, delights, if you will, might be a small piece of cheese or something like that. Okay. Yeah, or 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 um, free-ranging, you know, chickens mm -hmm. or a eggs from free-ranging chickens. But but I think your question, Alexandra, is a really good one because on the one hand, I would like to just say if you if you really I'd like to say if you really care about animals, then you would be vegan. But but mm -hmm. that's that's not quite true. You know, you know what I mean? I mean in some levels it's true, but once again, I know these very wealthy carnivores who put more money into conservation and into animal welfare issues than than I will make in my lifetime. But I, and I know that, that, that there's a whole literature on how many animals are killed in agriculture, you know, by vegans, you know, you know, even vegans are responsible for having animals killed in fields that are tilled for vegetables. I just find that to be just ridiculous. Okay. Um, but, but I do think that your question gets a conversation going with, which I've had with a lot of people. So the most basic thing I would say is for me, I, I, I got to the point where I could, no, I could no longer resolve that dissonance. I, I, I didn't need to eat animals and I didn't then, you know, 
subsequently need to eat animal products. People say it's so hard to do. It's not hard to do. I've traveled all over the world and been very active all over the world and, and stuff like that. So I think you've hit a topic that I, I think about a lot, but I would not say, I, I wouldn't want to say that if, I think the world would be better if everybody was vegan. It ain't going to happen overnight. But I, I wouldn't want to say that you have to be vegan in order to make a positive difference for animals. I, I just maybe wouldn't that's want to. Thank you for your, pointing that out. Your next books. Thank you yeah. so much, Dr. Beckoff. Well, thank thank you, you very, very much. It was really nice to see you again. Yes, a and, pleasure. Thank you. Um, Good to meet Dotsy up close. And, so close. <laughs> right. <laughs> Through the screen, <laughs> knock, knock. Yeah, right. No, thanks, thanks a million. For, um, I'm honored to be on your show. So Thank you, Dr. Thank Beckoff. You, you bet. So thank you so much for tuning in today. If we helped you in any way, then click the subscribe button and let's keep hanging out together. We have so much more to share with you. And if you need more information on actually making the switch for good, please visit us at switchforgood.org for loads of info. And you can subscribe to our mailing list where you will receive all sorts of super cool gifts, discount codes to our very fave dairy-free products, and a lifetime of powerful health tips. So join us on the journey to switch for good. This is the future.